Okay, so in this lecture, we are going to talk about quantization. In the previous lecture, we talked about pruning techniques that can help remove the number of parameters in a neural network. Okay? So the number of weights times the bit width per weight, that equals to the total model size. So one, uh, one method to reduce the model size is by uh, reducing the number of parameters. Okay? So the other way is to basically reduce Bits, number of bits to represent each okay. So this is the um, uh, agenda for today's lecture. We are going to first review the data type, data types. How are we going to represent the numbers? In A, as the 32, what are they? And then we are going to learn the basic concepts of network quantization. And then we are going to cover three types of widely used quantization methods, starting from the k-means phase quantization, uh, linear quantization, and also binary and ternary quantization. So again, model size are growing really fast, and we want to have a small model size and high accuracy. So uh, memory is expensive, we want to reduce the memory movement. So how should we make deep neural nets more efficient? So quantization is a very widely used technique that is orthogonal to pruning. So previously, can have a continuous signal okay, in the figure. Um, in the time uh, axis, we are sampling in time. In the y axis, we are quantizing in space. Okay? So all the signals um, in here, we quantize them to one, two, three, four, five discrete values. Okay? Although the signal is continuous, but we have only Five discrete values in this case. So quantization is a process of extreming the input from a continuous, okay? a continuous, okay? and otherwise large set of values, any value, okay? previously the large set of values, to a discrete set. In this case, only one, two, three, four, five, five sets. On the right hand side, it's showing an example of quantizing of an image. So this is the original image. Okay. Um, and now we are uh, quantizing them into a several pattern that we have given the pattern. Right? We have only a certain amount of patterns, and each pixel can only choose from one of these patterns. Okay? It's also called parametrization. Okay? We have uh, only a fixed amount of choices that we can pick for the whole image. Does the discrete set have to be smaller than the large set for it to be quantized? Yeah, I know you can. Uh, for quantization, the one you mentioned is simple resolution. Right? You don't have that uh, amount of pixels, but you want to expand the number of pixels. That's the word reverse size. Um, actually, whether that helps with accuracy remains to be a question, but for the speed and storage perspective, that definitely will make neural nets larger. Uh, but maybe that helps with some other per properties of neural nets. Feel free to try that in the science project. But usually, we will compress the model is strictly smaller than the number of original networks. So, first, let's uh, learn some foundation about numeric uh, data types. Okay? We are using GPUs. You might have heard about like, what is the FT32, FT16, int A. What are they? Right? So, just uh, this week, um, um, Jensen Huang, uh, the CEO of NVIDIA, during this uh, amazing uh, GPC talk, he released uh, the, the, the new GPUs right, which support uh, this FT8 uh, numerical system. So, what is FT8? What is FT32? What is it? You may also heard of uh, TF, deep brain flow, whatever. So, let's start uh, this journey by walking through, walk you through uh, uh, these representations in a well organized starting with integers. Okay. So you may familiar with that, there are iron signs and also there are sign integers. Okay. So this is a representation for this uh, uh, this is a eight bit iron sign integer integer. The lowest uh, bit is representing one, two to the power of one to the power of two. Okay. So this number is going to calculate for the number. So all the numbers are equal. And then, uh, in order to introduce the sign of this number, so we want to dedicate one bit, okay? dedicate one bit to be the sign bit. 
two ways to look together. Right? One is just by using this uh, sine magnitude interpretation. Right? The first bit just represents the sine, whether it's positive or negative. Right? The remaining bit just represents the maximum magnitude. For example, in this case, the sine bit is one, indicating that this is a, a negative number. Um, and then uh, we have the remaining bits uh, to represent the magnitude. In this case, it's minus or minus. So the range for this case will be um, in the power of n minus one. Uh, plus, uh, we can see the number of, number of um, range. The range we can represent um, is actually equal to the number of uh, number of bits minus one, which is dedicated to this one, which is the sine bit. So that's why it's minus two to the power of minus one. So uh, both all zeros, all one, all zeros represent zero. So we are actually wasting one strong for zero. So this is the function. No matter if it's positive or negative, as long as the negative is zero, is zero. So we should have so how, how can we avoid such waste? So we, can, uh, we have these two complement representation. So um, the positive one actually minus two to the power of minus three. So if we put them together, this number of two represents minus four So the one or the advantage of this method over this method is that we can uh, stick one more number. So the smallest number it can represent is no longer two to the minus two to the power of minus one minus one, but two minus two to the power of minus one. So all zeros that represent zero. But it's one zero zero that represents the smallest number, okay, which is minus two to the power of a minus one. Any questions on the integral interpretation? So on to this. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the Higgs problem. What if we want to represent um, a smaller number, smaller than one? Okay. So we introduce this decimal point. So above the decimal point, those are the integers. And to know that, those are the fraction numbers. Okay? For example, in this example, um, above the decimal point, we represent a two for starting from one, two, four. And below the decimal point, starting with half, uh, 0 0.5, a quarter, one eighth. Okay? So we put them together, we add the corresponding bits. Get 3.0625 represented by this number. Okay. Uh, let's see another example. Say this is the um, decimal point, so we want to um, add them up together. Um, this is the way to calculate by just having everything starting from 2 to the power of 0. Uh, and then we can observe how many bits we have for the fraction. Since there are four bits for the fraction part, we just calculate them as if so this is a pure sine integer and find the scaling factor to the power of four, indicating that actually we are moving the basic decimal point from here by four bits. So that we can represent um, this fractional number rather than four to nine. And then let's switch here to talk about floating point numbers. Widely used for things. Okay, so, this is the example of 32 bit floating point number. It uh, contains three parts. Okay, so, we have the sine bit, positive or negative, and then we have eight bit for the exponent. So, what is the exponent? Two to the power of exponent minus the bottom. And then we have 23 bit for the fraction. Okay, so, this fraction bit is also called the significant bits or the matrix. Significant bits, Mantita, fraction, they are meaning the same thing. So why do we invent this number of representation compared with the integer? What is the advantage of using this representation? Time bit one plus in this fraction bit times two to the power of exponent minus the power. So since we have eight bits for exponent in this so we have a bias to be 127 to the power of 8 minus 1 because we want to represent both 
positive button left by its opponent and also negative at its opponent. For example, if all of the blue bits are zero, okay, so here we have just a column of minus one point five. So compared with integer representation, what is the advantage of floating point representation? Larger range, exactly. Go to the power of its opponent and represent a much larger range of the power number, which is actually quite critical for training neural networks. When we are training the neural nets, especially during the first couple of iterations, the gradients vary a lot. And so the range, dynamic range, is pretty large. The largest number, the smallest number, you can use a lot. So using such floating point representation, with the same number of bits, it can have a much larger dynamic range. So let's see, for example, what number uh, that we represent. A bit exponent, I want to do a fraction, so let's calculate what is, uh, what is this number representing. Uh, here we have 1 to the uh, 125, okay. so this is for the exponent. Okay. So we want to um, subtract the 5 from this exponent, so that's to the power of minus 2. And then we have um, this fraction bit, okay, which is, we calculate this is um, not only one bit, this is 0 0.5, 1 also 1 8, 1 15. So this is exactly 0 0.065. Okay. So this is 1 dot 0 0.625. So we call it 1 dot something. Okay. This is the bit. And after that, we can calculate this is the final number. Okay. Why, why do we have the one plus fraction? Like why do we represent it like that? Is there a reason for it? Why you have the one plus fraction? Is it already been fraction of five? I don't know. Make sure it's easy for the arithmetic unit to calculate, and also you wanna make sure the range can be covering both a pretty large number or pretty pretty small number. So here is a whole family of different uh, floating point number representations. They have different uh, bit width for the exponent and also for the fraction bit. So the most popular is this um, FT32, the specifically FT32 standard representation, which has uh, 8 bits for the exponent, 23 bits for the fraction. So uh, this fine base for the 32 bits. And um, the cap partition, which is representing uh, 15 bits. So we have five exponent bits and 10 fraction bits. Okay, so the shorter um, exponent and the shorter fraction. And then uh, Google proposed this key app a couple of years ago, very recently. So brain float. So the brain float has the same amount of exponent bits. But much shorter uh, fraction bits. So all together has the same number of bits compared with this half partition. However, it has more um, exponent bits compared with the fraction bits. So what is the advantage of that? We can represent a much larger range during training. So uh, for neural networks, um, the precision, the absolute precision, uh, doesn't matter as much as the weight. So this is really um, efficient for getting a larger weight. Okay. That's the motivation for this uh, key app is to compare it half efficient with a larger uh, form. A couple of years ago, the media proposed this tensor flow 32. Okay. Why is it called tensor flow 32? Um, it has eight bits, um, which is the same as the uh, 32 bit. Uh, FT32 representation and the exponent uh, for the, um, the fraction bits is actually the same as the original FT32. So it's using the exponent of the FT32 while using really the fraction of the um, FT16. Okay, so it's a good trade off 
between the wings and out to the placebo. So altogether, it has 19. And then maybe AMD is the closest. Uh, AMD has 24. Another uh, representation which has seven bits for the exponent and 16 bits for the uh, fraction. Okay, so all together is 24. So recent years, the industry is coming up with drastically uh, very uh, different and very uh, innovative different number representations due to the uh, workload for the end. Okay? It's very hard in getting a lot of innovation recent years. In particular, uh, the fact the age is coming up as age is closing up. So the deep learning is very exciting, driving a lot of new innovations for this number representation system. All right. So uh, that's it. What was your question? So, with the engineering answer, so, right, um, the CFR ratio is a lot of things that you can refer to the square value, but I'm only using that. So, I'm asking for two basic bits. So, I'm going to ask you to give me 40 or 52. Or... Uh, so, 32 here means um, 32 is the same number, uh, same dynamic range of uh, 232, but different from all other representations. This is the only one that actually doesn't correspond to the exact number actually required. And this one, I, I, it's 24, not 24 bits. I, yeah, 16 or 16 bits. So this one actually have 19 bits. Just to follow up, why is 19 bits? That is a weird number, right? Right, in order to store them, uh, probably there are some very special mechanisms behind that. Yeah. It's not quite the right. Well, let's do some kind of calculation, right? What is the following half precision number uh, we get here? Five exponent bits, and then 10 uh, fraction bits. And this is the uh, half precision, which is actually quite widely used. Okay? So this uh, deep learning uh, parameter is 14. Okay? Almost no loss of accuracy. About 2x speed up, uh, saving the GPU, GPU memory by half. Very widely used. Two minutes for you to calculate um, what is this number representing. Okay. So we have five bits of exponent required, which is called four x. Okay, let's work on this together. So first of all, we have one bit for the sine bit, so that's the sine, so it's a minus number, and then the exponent we have one zero 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 one. So um, I know we subtract the bias, okay? since we have five bits, the bias is 16. 17 minus 16 is 2, okay? so the exponent is 2. And then we calculate the fraction. Okay? So this is representing the 0 0.6 bits and a half, which is one quarter, I think. So altogether it's 0 0.75. Okay? So the decimal answer will be 1 plus 5 times the power of 2. So it's actually um, minus 7. So let's do another reverse exercise. What is the decimal uh, 2.5 in green flow? In green flow 16, we have and five bit, eight bit of exponent, seven bit of fraction, and we always want to decompose it by one point something, which is one point two five, times the 
times with the power of one. Okay, so we have one sine bit, okay, and the floating binary um, is one part of this thing. Okay, and the fraction binary, as we mentioned before, we can calculate that. So we have two pi, which is zero and one, and then half, which is the quadrant. So the binary answer is. All right, so um, let's continue to talk about quantization. So there are several methods for quantization. Um, let's start with um, the most common one is, of course, using the floating point number to represent the total weight and also the calculation. And also, we are going to use those floating point arithmetic. Um, the other way, okay, we have k mean okay, we have integer weight, floating point total, which means um, we fold the, the weight into several buckets, okay, and each weight will choose from one of these buckets. Okay. And then we have this linear quantization of methods. Okay, so all the computation is in uh, integer arithmetic. Finally, we're also going to have binary or terminal quantization where the weight only choose from a positive value or, one, or negative value, okay, or in the, uh, including zero, which is even more not compact. So today, hopefully, we can cover both the k mean basic quantization and linear quantization. Next lecture, for the time to next time today, we're going to cover the binary quantization. So let's start with. This example where we have a uh, four by four weight mat matrix uh, which contains a 32 bit floating point number. Okay. These are all floating point numbers. Okay. But actually, in this deep learning, we don't need that high precision. Okay. 2.09, 2.12, 1.02, .02, we can just sometimes everything. Okay, 2.0. And we find it doesn't hurt the accuracy. So we have a uh, lab tool that will give you the opportunity to try, try out by yourself. The try by 10 data set playing such manipulation of the weight, quantize them, um, and approximate them, and observe the accuracy after it's done the job. So precision is kind of doesn't matter for either training or input. I think it really is very like For, for the right? If the network is already trained, the content of the lower precision above the third threshold, the one we will get. For training, we also active research, pushing below uh, 16 bits, and you can use 8 bits for training, because you'll find that things are working. What's the lowest anyone's ever really gone? Has anyone ever gone something silly like the GS? Yeah, we'll talk about that in the binary neural net. Only positive one, negative one. Okay. Let's start a journey together. So, yeah, so uh, let's just uh, do a k-means clustering to find which weights are, are similar. So these are similar weights around the school. And the green colors, they're around minus one. And the pink color is around 1.5. Okay. So we may as well. Let's do a k means class ring, find um, the sine point of 1, 0, 1, 1, 5, and okay, in this case. For example, if the weight is 2.19 and 2.14, we may as well just quantize both of them to 2.0. Okay. So previously we have to draw this full 32 bit floating point. Now we can only draw the 2 bit index by 2 bit because we have a 4 entry in the total. So we can use qubit to represent uh, which uh, bucket that this weight belongs to. So this blue weight belongs to the third bucket. This is two, therefore we are drawing three in this location. So it's a very smart way that we have a tiny little code book. We can use qubit, only four entries. If we use four bits, that's going to be only 16 entries. It's very limited amount of uh, workload, uh, code book. 
Um, and then we just store the uh, integer value in a very low space and store it to that. So finally, after contradiction, we get wait, something like this. This is the contradiction error. I have something with matrices, with the previous with matrix, and we find that the value to be We are going to show the accuracy impact very soon, but first let's analyze the saving of the storage. This example, we have 15 numbers. Each one is stored in 32 bits. Together we need 64 bytes. For the images, each one is represented by only two bits. We have 16 of them, so multiplying them together is 32 bits, which is each four bytes. Each byte is eight bits. You can remember from six level four. Remember. And finally, we have to store this code book. Since we have only four pointers, so um, each one is represented by 32 bits, all together with 16 bytes. All together, uh, we need to use 20 bytes. We need 20 bytes to store them together, which is 3.2 times smaller compared to this original original. But this is a very small example. Imagine this weight matrix becomes pretty large. What should be roughly the impact ratio if you use only Bits to represent this number. It seems correct. So the uh, size of the code book could be ignored. Right? Only four numbers. Uh, if the weight matrix is super large, then the case where the number of pointers is much larger than um, n is the number of bits. So if we call it n, we will say four is the number of uh, values in the code book. And I have numbers, so all together we need 32 and bits. Um, for the images, we get n and bits. And for the code book, uh, we need 32 bits for each number times the total of n and bits. So since this number is pretty small, we have only 16 numbers in the four bits. Uh, we can ignore that part. So the compression ratio is 32 divided by n. Yeah, exactly. Like, 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 that's similar to cloning. Like, sparsity ratio. How sparse do you need, right? Like, how many bits do you need for this data? We are going to cover the technique. So, you can imagine the fewer number of bits, the lower the accuracy. If before the accuracy drops pretty fast, that's the point you want to go. Very good question. Yeah, that's a good point. So we are exactly doing one of the level in direction. But here, like we mentioned in the first part of the lecture, data movement is expensive, computation is cheap. Like here, we need to only uh, deliver it from a register file that has only four entries. Okay. Compared with, you know, we have to uh, go to the main memory to fetch such a large amount of numbers. Here, uh, referencing, referencing a, a register file, which is, of course, will be in the cache, but will be much more uh, cheaper compared with if you have to go to the main memory to get the 32 bits rather than the only two bits. Uh, the trade off is worth it. Yes, that's right. Does that mean you all the How was the question? Yeah, due to you are saving the uh, saving the memory, it will not solve. We'll cover in the later part of this lecture. Four bits will make sure you have no loss of access. So that's only 16 numbers. Of course, can see for the very expensive. The distribution of weights and percentage will make a difference here. You have a Gaussian and mean cluster and four different clusters, and two of them will be better than the other two. Yeah, I'll one. show you the distribution. So that's exactly my coming slide. I'll show the distribution before and after uh, this computation. Um, OK, 
So this requires specialized hardware support. So this is not uh, in the main menu, but it's included in the on chip SRAM since this is a pretty small code book, okay, uh, which can be completed within one cycle to access one on all four members. Yeah, so this menu is not supported in general architecture. Uh, GPU or GPU. But recently, um, the NPU, uh, there is one NPU that is actually supporting this. Palletization. iPhone is possible utilizing the technology. So specialized data part requires the specialized data part. So let's see how do we tune or fine tune the model if the weights are shared in a certain manner. Okay, so we get the gradient out of this weight matrix. Okay, so these are the gradients corresponding to the same pattern. And then we group them by, by the index. We group them by column. We uh, sum them up together. Okay. Um, these are the uh, summation of the gradients to uh, tune the sample. And then we are going to modify the variables subtracted from the original sample. And then we will get the updated uh, fine tune of sample in the pattern. Okay. So this is a way to fine tune such a uh, weight shared neural. And let's see how um, does equity go as we have fewer number of weights. So um, this is laws of equity, we will not reduce them. So this is about the size of ratio after compared to from 100% uh, all the way to here at 8%. So in computation, the equity is going to drop roughly 12% uh, and then so the equity is going to drop. Assuming only um, it's going to drop in the manner. And then uh, the best way is to combine Boolean and composition together. So the ratio for LXS is equal to Boolean and then composition. So we can make it roughly uh, three times of the original time. So here, let's brainstorm a little bit. Should we do Boolean first and then quantization? Or should we do quantization first and then do Boolean? First. So you want to first reduce the number of weights, okay, and then we reduce the number of uh, bits per weight. Okay. So each weight you will have a less number of bits, and then you have less number of samples. These are orthogonal techniques. So let's see what happens to the weight distribution um, before and after composition. Okay. So this is the uh, weight distribution after pruning. Which we have shown in the previous lecture where everything near zero they are removed. And after fine tuning, the weight becomes smoother. Right? What happens after uh, this composition? The value becomes discrete. So we have discrete value, but still the distribution roughly forms with two peaks with very little weight in the middle. So after composition, we have discrete weight. And then what about after fine tuning? So the weight slightly shifted to left or right. This is before and this is after. We can observe these small changes of the location of the weight due to uh, this fine tuning to recover the accuracy and after composition. And let's see uh, how many bits are we quantized before we do that. Here is the experiment. The experiment um, uh, on the LX map. Okay, so this is the convolution layer, and this is a relay, the connector layer. Um, so for the convolution layer, as we are reducing the number of bits, okay, the accuracy begins to drop around four bits. Okay, so this is the top five accuracy, which is the top one accuracy. Okay. And we 
we are showing uh, two scenarios. One is form type only. The other is boolean and form type. So showing that actually we can combine boolean and boolean, which is very similar. Zero uh, versus red, they are almost uh, overlapping each other, showing that even after boolean, we can still quantize them to the boolean of about four. If we go for this, um, this quantized angle, which soon starts quantized, we start to differ a little bit. But in general, four bits are doing very little. For the FT layer, we do even less. Right? So we actually run on the chain, and here we quantize them to only two bits. Only two bits. And just uh, make it very easy to store the weights in on chip and friend rather than having to. So after uh, this weight value uh, composition, we find the weight distribution is um, not forming a uh, not uniform distribution. And some of the weights are very popular, some of the weights uh, are very not popular. Right? So we want to represent those two frequent weights, those two frequent weights, two frequent weights. Uh, using more bits to represent. And for those very frequently occurring weights, we can use uh, a less number of bits to represent. So rather than using the same number of bits, four bits, two bits, for all the numbers, we want to use different number of bits to represent different numbers. The very popular one we use less number of bits. So the less frequent one is a fewer number, uh, we use more number of bits. So overall, uh, we can use to further reduce the storage required to store the weights. So uh, put them together, we have this version pipeline that can drastically reduce the model size of the neural network. Refers to tuning, which uh, if you have less number of weights, and then competition has less number of bits per weight. And then finally, half the coding with a different number of uh, bits for popular versus infrequent weights. Okay. So, tuning we tune the connectivity, tuning and iteratively tune and fine tune that. Um, that can give you a same accuracy, but uh, 9 to uh, so 13 x reduction of the model size. And then, quantization we can search faster weights, and color them into different colors, create a code book, and then we quantize the weights according to the code book. And retrain the code. In this manner, we can further improve the compression to 27 to 31. Finally, we can store the weights and index okay, so that we can use different number of bits for a popular versus different weights. And finally, reach the 35 to 49 x reduction of the model size. So here is showing the compression results for several uh, popular neural nets. Versus on the ImageNet data set. So, uh, ImageNet is probably known system for LXNet, reduced from 49 megabytes to only uh, 7 megabytes. Its accuracy originally is uh, 80.7, uh, now it's 80.3. Okay. Uh, so, this result is 2016. So, these days, even the top one accuracy, which is the yeah, well, latest work out there, you can be actually, you can usually get 80% top one accuracy. So that could be a good example for you to do a final product and explore this modern neural network, how does the tuning ratio uh, look like either for NLP models, for transformers, for even transformers. So BGG originally took a number of 550 megabytes, so after compression only about 11 accuracy is still about Cool net, very efficient to begin with, similarly for red and green screen. Um, they can be compressed less, but again, an order of magnitude compression, only a couple of megabytes, very easy to fix on chip at time, so that you can uh, avoid those off chip to run access. And the interesting thing is that no matter how large they are to begin with, after compression, they are just roughly in the order of a couple of megabytes. Model capacity. So 
the next question is basically rather than compressing these models into a large model to a small model, can we in event and design small and compact models to begin with? And whether some small model can be compressed after. So in order to explore this question, uh, in this migration was mostly uh, a couple of years ago we uh, we designed this case map. Okay? So the idea is that using this one of one convolution to choose the number of channels by a uh, factor of four before we choose the the three by three convolution. Okay? And then we have these two branches uh, to capture the information of the resolution. And up, uh, up to the number of channels to 64 again before the repeating to the next step. And this is showing the visualization is much deeper uh, at that time. So, as a result, this squeeze map is 550, uh, 510 times smaller than the original Alex map for maintaining the same accuracy. So, we can look at this step by step. So squeeze map is originally much smaller, like 50x smaller than the original Alex map. So the equivalent from 8 megabytes instead of the uh, full 40 megabytes. So 50 times smaller, the same accuracy. Still, such a model is still amiable to compression. So after compression is only 0.4 standard model, less than half a megabyte. So we are maintaining accuracy being 500 times smaller. So showing that even a small compact model is a full compression. So in two, two lectures, we are going to learn neural architecture search techniques that can automatically generate a simplified synthesis neural network architectures that fit the particular uh, model type system or latency system or form system. So you want a model that is less than 3.2 megabytes. How do we design such a model? Previously, we have to manually search either different channel number, different resolution, different width, different depth. Now we have an automated tool to simplify neural network that can fit a target okay. All right, so this is a summary for the K means space uh, weight. We have originally a 32 bit floating point number, and then we have four of them. Parts. One is the code book, very small. Four entries for two bits, 16 entries for four bits. And then when we store this into the indexes, we do the composition. Um, we slide the level of interaction where we have all the code book and four categories. We decode it by referencing the code book to get the real uh, floating point weight. And the weight and, uh, and input are still uh, calculated using floating point weight. And that is applied as the final output. Okay, so, this is the implication of that. And in the next part, we are going to learn we don't, we don't have those floating point units at all. We only, only have those integer units that uh, will be covered by the, uh, the linear computation. So, in the first half, we introduce this K mean space composition, which will be part of your. Uh, homework assignment for that tool, which is easy to implement, and also a response time that's lower, lower number of bits. However, that requires specialized hardware support, which is specialized data path, which will be the level of interaction. And to make it simpler, uh, we have this linear quantitative situation techniques that can run on existing CPUs and GPUs, so we see that we actually part of that work. Okay. So before jumping to the uh, contents, there's a little bit of, of, of more math in, in this lecture, so ho hopefully get a little bit prepared. I will walk you through that slowly. Feel free to raise any questions if you want to follow um, the last half of the lecture. Okay. okay, starting with the same matrix, floating point four by four matrix. Okay. What we are going to do is going to use those integer representations. Okay, we are going to have uh, a code book. Now the page code book is, is linear. Okay. Um, uh, this if you run, if you do a one, and then zero is zero, or one is minus one, and one zero minus two, two complement representations we will call from six double four. And then we are going to introduce a strong time unit representing two bit signed integers. Okay, so this one actually is represented by uh, by one. And then we introduce this, this zero point. This is another concept we need to uh, introduce. Learn how to determine that very soon. I'll just give you 
your pi by the heart here, how does that work? So I got minus the zero point, um, and then scale them by using a Boltzmann form number, okay, so that we can uh, get a power matrix. So we are going to use this matrix uh, for matrix multiplication for inference, and this matrix computation error. The difference between uh, the linear computation versus k means computation is that these signs for it, okay, they are linear. Okay? The distance between each sign for it are equal. Okay? Versus the previous line, remember we have uh, 1, we have 1.5, we have minus 1, the distance is not equal. Okay, okay so um, we have this equation where we want to have this linear projection from the integer weight to this floating point. Okay, so this is I prime matrix of integers to a real number, okay, from Q to R, okay, from quantized to real. We are going to use this notation throughout this lecture. So we are going to have this um, linear matching um, by subtracting from a, a real zero point and fill it by a factor of S. So the S is a floating, floating point number, this is a composition uh, fragment. Prime ahead of prime. And the z is zero point is an integer number. Okay, so for, again, another quantization factor we have to describe uh, before uh, the inference time, which allow a real number zero to be exactly represented by the integer number z. Okay, so z will be mapped to zero. Okay, so this integer value z will be mapped to the value zero in the total. That's the function of the integer. We want to make sure um, there is some number that is exactly representing zero. Okay? So z is actually representing a zero number zero. That's the definition of the zero point. Because zero is very important. Right? After pruning, we have so many zeros. We want to make sure some value, some integer value is actually representing the floating point zero. Okay? And what is that number? That is So this is a mapping between uh, the quantized value to the uh, uh, the floating point number. So this is the actual number. This is the linear um, uh, the uh, integer represent representation for that. Okay. So let's introduce a few notations. Two means we um, given a certain number of bits. In this case, we have eight numbers, three bits. Okay. This is the smallest value it represents. This is the largest number it represents. Using the uh, using three bits, okay. and R mean is the smallest uh, floating point number across its ten bits. Okay. R max is the largest number in this. Here, um, for the uh, Q mean and Q max for different bit width, we have different widths. Okay. So this two bit width um, actually this is reversed. Q max is the mean one minus two will be three minus four. We can just correct it right after the after the uh, lecture, and then um, we are going to find this, this mapping uh, between the uh, mean and two max. Put in the equation where we have this identifying mapping where uh, we're turning the quantized value to the uh, to the floating point value. Uh, two max will be mapped uh, to this R max. Two max will be mapped to R max. Two mean will be mapped to R mean. In, in this case, we can calculate what is the scaling factor by subtracting these two uh, equations. Intuitively, the scaling factor is the ratio between it's the dynamic range of the floating point number versus the range of the integer number. So we can calculate the scaling factor will be uh, the distance between R max and R min, which is Q max and Q min. Intuitive understanding. We are basically shrinking or pruning the root of x. And how do we uh, calculate that? So that's really simple. Using our familiar root matrix, four by four root matrix, we are going to calculate the max, which is this number, 2.12. The mean is minus 1.08. We subtract them, uh, which corresponds to the range in the floating point number. This is blue range. And the denominator. Is the range for this uh, integer number. So here we 
here, I use only two grids. So the range is ranging from one to minus two. So it's actually three. Okay. So dividing these ranges, we can get the scaling factor is actually 1.07. Okay. So that's how we calculated this scaling factor, 1.07, uh, which is confused between this largest and smallest number okay, in the floating point representation versus in the linear representation. We show is basically the scale of one four seven. So far so good. The set size of the integer. Oh yeah, is it acceptable as one or is it like is it just one? Um it is always one. And let's continue to talk about. Um, so far, we uh, we get uh, how to get the S as a scaling factor, and then let's talk about how to get the other factor. Right? In the calculation, we have scaling factor, we have a zero point. Now let's calculate the zero point. Okay. Remember, uh, we have this I find acting between this content value to this uh, real value. Okay. Um, let's just rotate the we can we can get R mean divided by S. We can get the zero point divided by Pv minus R mean divided by S. Okay. Um, which is basically saying we want to have uh, the R mean increase by ratio. And okay. calculate the difference between two means and that ratio. Okay. So that we can get the Pv which is zero point. What is special what is special for me okay. among all these points? will be mapped to zero. Okay, so that's the definition of zero point. Very simple math, but I want you to have the intuition. Not only the math, but also the intuition. P will be mapped to zero. And the calculation of that will be the one if we are using an integer. We want to make sure this is an integer. Alright, so let's see in this example how do we calculate this. Okay. Um, P equals to P V minus R R mean is basically the smallest value of this weight uh, matrix, which is minus 1.08. S is what we just calculated, 1.07. Q mean, maybe this will stop. They both the smallest number we have in the representation is minus 2. Therefore, we calculate this number and round it to get 1. In this case, uh, this 1 in the integral representation will be mapped to 0 in the floating point. So with that, we have enough knowledge to calculate how do we do a uh, matrix multiplication in uh, integer arithmetic on a computer with an integer arithmetic. How do we do a matrix multiplication for a uh, floating point um, uh, neural net? So assume there's no bias for that, and then we are going to calculate uh, what do we have bias. Okay, so we have simple as y equal to W times x, W is the weight. It's pre computed, it's a constant. And x is the input activation is dynamic. So we plug in this I find transformation. So let me move the screen a little bit so it's not shadow. So we, we are going to have this equation throughout this transform. So we plug in um, uh, the, the W representation, which is a scaling factor. Uh, Qw quantized version minus the new zero point where p will be back to zero okay? and times the scaling factor of the uh, input okay? times the q minus uh, the zero point of p. Similarly for y, we also plug in um, the quantized value. Next, we are going to move by just calculating what is q1. Okay? So, uh, we are going to multiply this SW and SX together, divided by SY. Okay? And these terms stay the same. Okay? We also move the dy from here over there. I want to make sure that understand this equation since we will implement that in, the, in our tool. Um, and then we are going to uh, expand these two terms. Okay? The two terms 
put them all together with a four term. And we are going to take a careful look at these four terms, which are possible. But is, these are all matrices, right? So dividing by S1 is just multiplying by the inverse, or? S is a scaling factor. It's, oh, a, right. it's not a matrix. Yeah. 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 All right. So um, we are going to do uh, first, this is, is, a, uh, is a number, it's not a matrix. And then uh, this is an unbit integer addition. And here is the unbit unbit integer multiplication. This means these are all integer mm -hmm. matrix. What we want to do here is a bit of simulation to prevent uh, the overflow. Okay. Um, so these values, x weight, remember weight is when you split the unit into functions. The zero point is also a function. Zero point is the whole function. Okay. So we can be pre computing one term. Okay. And for this number, the scaling factor, okay, we can actually uh, represent this number by to the power of n times a fixed point um, value. Okay? Uh, this value is between 0 0.5 and 1. So there is a, a very simple equation that can, a function in the library that will help you do that decomposition. So actually, you can use integer multiplication to do the integer. And then you can uh, actually do bit shift with 2 to the power of n can be easily implemented by shift. So that multiplying with this scaling factor even doesn't require a floating point arithmetic. So all integer arithmetic I deal with at this problem. So with that, um, continue the discussion. What about this ZW times 2x? So ZW is a zero point for the weight. Okay? Um, and 2x is not a constant, therefore we cannot pre-compute that. So how do we evaluate that? We see the distribution of the weight, and usually it forms roughly a normal distribution where the center is roughly around zero. So, during the competition, to make the calculation easier, we just set this ZW to zero okay? so that we can eliminate this term, this, this green term, okay? by setting ZW to be zero, meaning that zero in the quantized values will also be mapped to zero in the floating point. Given the intuition that uh, the weight distribution is roughly symmetrical. So let's see uh, what happens if we set z to be zero. So zero will be mapped to the integral representation, which is a floating point representation. Now the zero points are aligned. Previously, it's not aligned. So um, let's see the dynamic range. If you have four uh, dynamic range, there are two ways um, to calculate um, the scaling factor in this case. So remember, the scaling factor is defined as the ratio between the range of the um, original uh, floating point dynamic range versus the integer dynamic range. Okay. Um, and we can also use this expression to calculate the dynamic range to be R mu divided by Q minus V. Um, in this case, if z is zero, then we can directly populate that by minus r max versus q min, which is uh, minus r actual value max uh, versus uh, divided by q min. So this is um, by force make native implementation and also uh, omics implementation. Uh, the tricky part here is that we have uh, an even number of but one of them is zero. Therefore, the next thing that is possible is the unequal. And so the three positive values, one, two, three, or four negative values. So which one should we have for which? The first method is uh, using the uh, R mean, to, uh, the true mean to calculate the risk. Okay? And in the next one, we can also use the true max to calculate the range. This means we have an even number of positive and negative uh, number of sensors. So if we use uh, this Q max and R max to calculate the range, so that will be R max divided by Q max. And carry that in the previous example, we are using uh, that divided by the Q mean. So this differs slightly a little bit. 
experience of the spot. Okay, but this is the method that is used by TensorFlow, by the media Tensor IP, in the library. So that the sum of the two. Okay, so um, in the high level, we have this asymmetric linear computation, meaning that um, the zero point is not zero. You are matching a non zero letter to a zero. Symmetric linear quantization is saying that zero will be mapped to zero. Um, Integer value zero will be mapped to the floating point value zero. So there are pros and cons for both of them. First of all, uh, the asymmetric one time the range is fully neutralized. Right? So the whole range, the original value, the whole range for the point. And the implementation is more compact. Of course, we have zero D value, uh, and zero point requires additional logic. Okay. And for symmetric representation, not all the weights are symmetric, and activation is not symmetric, especially when you have the gradual activation function. When you are quantizing the activation, you assume zero will be mapped to zero. Then you are wasting half of the range. In alpha value, there is no negative number, but it's still dedicated a few uh, centroids to represent those negative numbers. But alpha value can only have a positive number. So that's the problem of wasting, uh, moving one bit, wasting one bit back to that. That's the metric But the advantage is that the implementation. Is much simpler. Since we can get rid of this term, um, which is dw is zero, so zero will be back to zero, so zero point is w of the matrix. Um, and also for the activation, no matter what it is, since it's dynamic, we can get rid of that term, which will simplify our equation to be this basic factor of weight activation and the output. We have this uh, also for the um, additional uh, zero point for the uh, for the for the y. Okay. So now we have only um, uh, one last thing to solve, which is the bias. Just now we uh, calculated uh, that we don't have bias. It's y is equal to wx. Now we have wx plus b. How do we handle the bias in the neural network? This is a function, so again, we plug in the matching, okay, minus the bias, zero point of the bias, and then find the sigma factor of the bias. Since they can be changed together, so it's good, um, and, and change the, the sigma factor can uh, stay constant by uh, manipulating the, the field bias as well. Both of them are constant. Two constants multiplied together is on this level or on this level. So uh, just like before, we said dw to be zero, okay, so we can simply simplify that by setting this uh, dw to be zero. So here we have only two terms by getting rid of this dw and we distribute this qw to qx and gx okay, and combine xw and xx. And then we have this uh, couple of remaining terms we can deal with. In order to merge these two terms together, remember the S Q, which is the bias, which is a given factor, they're both constant. The two constants multiplied together, we can set one of them to be an arbitrary value, so we can uh, adjust the other one accordingly. So in order to merge them together, we set S B to be equal to S W I X. So we set S B to be the same times that back. So now we can further simplify the equation by merging this dd, uh, this dd into uh, this term. And also we set zd to be zero again. Right? So the, the zero point of the bias to be also zero. So let's do this again. We have these two terms, we call like before, and then we have this dd which becomes here. Since d becomes the same as w, this is the last complicated equation, so 
make sure you're out of space. Go back a little bit. Okay. First, assume v double to be zero. That's when the weight distribution is symmetric. We map the middle to be zero. And then we set dg to be zero again. So the bias also is uh, uh, symmetric. So we set zero to map to zero. And then we set the scaling factor for the bias to the same as the modification of the scaling factor of the weight and acquisition so that we can combine the terms in this form. So that's the root. I feel like I'm missing a few of these equations. I don't see y equals wx in this representation, but then all these equations of s and they're all integers. So how is it is it like each in, like integer equation is it like mapping to like one element of the matrix? Or how is it represented? Uh, so this is matrix, this is matrix. Okay, so this is also a uh, um, the scaling factor is is not a matrix, the scaling factor is just a, just a value. Oh, so Q and Z are. Yeah, Q um, and um, the QX, the QW, and the QZ, uh, they are metrics. And Z is a constant. It's a value. Uh, so that's the element of Y zone. Okay, we're almost there. So we have three assumptions, and then we can further simplify the truth in this manner. Um, so we will always put uh, the QXY uh, to the right, and then we can have the final collection of things that I can output, which is a combined scaling factor, and then uh, W times X, which is all, these are all constants, so we can treat and treat them. Okay. And also we define the Q bias to be QB minus uh, the term. So we can further simplify that as by doing two bias instead of this middle part. Okay. And then by examining the current representation, we get a very simple form. Okay. So the output is the scaling factor times the weight times the activation, the matrix modification or convolution in every half, and then plus the two bias, which is defined within the two system, okay, plus the z y, the zero point of the uh, Calculate that as pure integer, integer uh, uh, modification. Okay, so all of these are integers. Okay, and then we can rescale that to uh, integer and then shift it. Okay, and uh, finally, uh, add the n bit integer uh, bias. That is matrix modification. So, what if we have convolution? It's very similar. We just replace. Matrix modification with the convolution. Okay. So the top are the problem of convolution and then that's the okay. So let's see the computation of graph. So we have the front has the input and the front has the weight. This is a constant. Okay. So they are both integers. So do an integer convolution on top of this weight, weight and activation, we get an integer output. Um, we add this front size of higher. Uh, accumulate that in the 32 bit floating point, which prevents the over, uh, overflow. Okay. And then we try, uh, we modify it by the scaling factor. The scaling factor modification can be also done by integer, followed by a uh, shift. Okay. And then we add the zero point, okay, at the zero point of the y, and finally we get a front eyes output, which, which can be fed to the next. And the intuition between behind this scaling factor is that it basically contains three terms: the weight, the activation, and the output. Okay. So that makes sure um, the output in Q can be directly fed to the next layer. So why you uh, you observe the distribution? You want to feed the neural net with like a hundred or five hundred images and compute the statistics. That's called collaboration. Also, the x y can never be computed by the x. In that way, x y. All right, so this is showing the improvement compared with using floating point versus the integer. What is the latency versus what is the accuracy? So, with the same accuracy, we can reduce the latency from 50 milliseconds to about 5 milliseconds. 
for the uh, speed up and also the improvement. So the uh, accuracy in fair with open point um, where we have introduced just now, there's a little bit of law of accuracy, uh, which is in the uh, 2008 case. So nowadays, the more advanced techniques that can uh, do such post tuning conversation, conversation where fine tuning weight equalization, as long as we will cover in the next lecture, to bridge the gap. So nowadays, we can pretty much fully bridge the gap by using a to integer uh, to have the same accuracy as the open point. So hopefully, it's done. All right, so we learned Cayley quantization. What is a linear quantization? Went through all the equations, and now basically we have an idea how to calculate the pilot of the structure of the And in the next lecture, we are going to cover more aggressive quantization techniques and binary or family representation. Okay, so here's a, oh, okay, second, mm -hmm. okay, thank you. So here's a summary for today's lecture. We first review the data type, what is RT32 free float to the tensor float 32 with RT a half position, full position. And then we learn the basics of composition, including K means composition, and also the linear composition. Okay. That's all for today's lecture. Thank you so much. Uh, hope you have a good weekend.